Okay. Hi, everyone. Today we have Gedas with us. Gedas is a postdoctoral researcher at Facebook AI. He's working on computer vision and machine learning problems. He's currently focusing on video understanding. You probably heard about his work, Musk Prop. That's actually how I found out about his papers. And a recent paper, Transformer, both on video understanding. Um, he received his bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College and PhD from University of Pennsylvania. His work was nominated for CVPR 2020 Best Paper Award, and it's a pleasure to have Gedas with us today. Thank you, Gedas. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about some of my recent work on visual perception models for semantic video understanding. Um, yeah, let, let me start this presentation by showing you the following video. No, wait. So this is a simple video that captures a person who is making a grilled cheese sandwich. And as we're watching this video, it's very easy for us to understand exactly what's happening in this video. So initially we see this person grilling a sandwich, then he's cutting it. Afterwards, he goes to the fridge to get several different sauces. He then dips his sandwich into these sauces, takes a big bite out of it, and then lastly shares uh, several bits of his sandwich with his two dogs. And so similarly, how we can understand this um, video very easily, the goal of my research is to build computer vision models and that could also understand complex sequences of human behavior, such as this one. And so how do we develop AI systems like this? Uh, so as humans, we know that we rely on vision to make these sort of higher level inferences about a person's behavior. Um, so for example, in this case, we can recognize all of the objects appearing in this video. We understand how this person is interacting with these objects and we can use all of this information to infer what kind of actions this person is performing now and maybe even what his future actions might be. And so similarly, uh, I wanna inject the same kinds of capabilities into our computational models. Um, and I think this would enable lots of cool applications uh, for uh, geared towards human behavior understanding. And so that's gonna be the main focus on my today's presentation. And so specifically, we'll be looking at this from a few different angles. So first I'll present a framework for uh, learning to detect and track objects in video. A afterwards, I'll talk a little bit about a framework of uh, uh, learning a representation that would be useful for understanding how humans interact with objects. And lastly, I'll present our latest framework for recognizing human actions in video. So let me start with this first topic of uh, learning to see objects in video. And in this case, our goal is to develop a framework for simultaneously classifying, segmenting, and tracking object instances in video. And so this is commonly referred to as a video instance segmentation problem. And so as you can see, uh, compared to standard instance segmentation images, now in addition to being able to detect and um, classify objects in individual frames, we also need to be able to track them over an entire video sequence. So that's going to be the main challenge. And then we look at some of the prior work in this area. So prior work before our method. So the most successful uh, method uh, in video and sense segmentation is this uh, ensemble approach that won the ICCV 2019 video and sense segmentation challenge. And basically what these guys did is they decomposed this problem into several uh, subproblems, uh, such as classification, detection, segmentation, and tracking. They then solved each of these problems independently and combined these solutions together. And so how this might work in practice is that maybe initially we would apply mask CNN on the individual frames just to get initial detections and segmentations. Afterwards, we might apply an optical flow network to establish some temporal correspondences for objects across different frames. And lastly, maybe we will feed all of this information to some other tracking system that would essentially uh, produce a final uh, solution to the video and segmentation problem. And so as you can see, so this is a very complicated system that contains many different components. 
but we also argue that um, it, from the standpoint of performance, it's probably suboptimal because each of these components, uh, they're optimized individually with their own, uh, with respect to their own task. But the entire framework is never optimized with respect to this target video and segmentation task. And so our goal in this work is to essentially simplify this pipeline while also maintaining and potentially maybe even improving the performance um, of the system. And so the key challenge, uh, as already described, is that in this case, uh, we need to be able to establish temporal correspondences uh, across uh, for object instances across different frames. And in this case, we want a unified uh, system where basically we would be able to establish these temporal correspondences in an end-to-end -end learnable fashion. So that's our goal. And so before I start describing our methodology for this problem, I also briefly wanted to talk uh, about some of the background information that will be necessary to understand how our system works. And so namely, uh, I wanna discuss some of the key ideas behind deformable convolution, which we're gonna use um, for this part of the talk. Uh, so I'm sure all of you are familiar with how standard convolution works, uh, basically consists of two main steps. So the first step involves sampling points from a uniformly spaced grid. So for example, if we have a three by three convolutional kernel, uh, for every point, we would be sampling nine points from these local three by three neighborhoods. Uh, so that's the first step. And then the second step would involve applying a weighted summation between these sampled values um, and learnable convolutional weights. And so when we consider deformable convolution, the only difference is that now, um, instead of sampling points from a uniformly spaced grid, now we can essentially sample points from a variety of different locations as is shown in the slide. And so this is beneficial because it basically provides more flexibility to our model and it also allows it to learn more powerful features. And so how this works in practice is that given an initial input feature map, we can attach a separate convolutional layer to that feature map, uh, which then predicts uh, a set of offsets for every single pixel. Uh, so for example, again, if we have this three by three convolutional kernel, we would be predicting nine offsets for every single pixel. And so these nine offsets uh, would, would be different for every single pixel in this case. And so once we have that, then we can feed the offsets um, as well as these initial input feature maps into the deformable convolution operator. And then it basically just applies a standard convolution operation, but now it does the sampling according to these predicted offsets as opposed to just sampling from a uniformly spaced grid. Uh, and so the nice thing about this, uh, this deformable convolution operator is that every operation here is fully differentiable. So whatever framework we build, uh, whatever framework that uses these deformable convolutions, uh, it can basically be optimized end-to-end -end with respect to our target task. Uh, and in our case, this is a video and segmentation problem. And so the motivation for using these deformable convolutions is that in this case, we believe that uh, they will basically allow us to better capture motion between object instances across different frames. So that's why we propose to use this. And so now with this uh, background information in mind, uh, I can present our mask propagation system, which we call mask prop. So our system operates on video clips of about three seconds in length. Um, so these video clips are long enough to allow us to jointly solve for instant segmentation and tracking problems, even if they are challenging cases of occlusions. Uh, at the same time, they're short enough to fit in a GPU memory, which is an important constraint because um, lots of these video clips come at a very high spatial resolution. So uh, we always need to be cautious of the GPU memory. And so then uh, given these video clips as our inputs, our goal is to produce coherent clip level instant segmentation tracks for every object instance appearing in the middle frame. So for example, in this case, the middle frame is frame T. We have two object instances here, uh, a hand and a lizard. And so our goal is to produce these clip level instance tracks for every one of these objects. And we accomplished this as follows. So given an input video clip and its corresponding frame level features that were uh, extracted for every time step, we first focus on these object instances appearing in the middle frame. And these are denoted um, as instances I and J here. And we have the same two object instances as before. And so now for every object instance in the middle frame, uh, we essentially propagate its respective features from frame T to all the other frames in the middle clip. 
uh, so from all the from frame T to all the other frames in the clip. And so the idea here, the purpose of this temporal feature propagation is that uh, it allows us to essentially construct these instance specific feature tensors that are also now spatially aligned with these frame level features that we previously extracted for every time step. And as you might have guessed already, this temporal feature propagation scheme is implemented using deformable convolutions, uh, which essentially, given this uh, feature tensor from uh, time t, they warp it to uh, any other frame in a video clip according to the predicted uh, sampling offsets. And so as you can imagine, in this case, in order for this temporal feature propagation scheme to be effective, the offsets that are predicted by our model, they essentially need to capture motion cues between object instances across different frames. And that's the only way that this is going to work. And so in this case, we note that uh, our model is able to predict these offsets uh, implicitly without any explicit optical closed supervision or any other ground truth alignment. So just basically by being optimized with respect to this video and sense segmentation task. Uh, and as I already mentioned, we repeat this temporal feature propagation scheme for every object instance appearing in the middle frame. And so now that we have these uh, temporally propagated features, we can actually then combine them with the frame level of features that we previously extracted for every time step. And the idea here is that uh, aggregating these two types of features, uh, it essentially allows us to reinforce the signal associated with uh, each object instance. And so once we do that, we can then use the resulting feature tensors to produce these uh, clip level instance segmentation masks uh, for every object instance. And so our entire framework then is optimized, our entire framework, which includes this temporal feature propagation scheme uh, implemented using deformable convolutions, as well as this frame level uh, feature extraction, it's optimized end to end with respect to this uh, soft intersection over union loss which is computed for every object instance across the entire video club. Um, and so as already mentioned, so that's kind of the, the nice thing about these deformable convolutions that um, they ba they're basically fully differentiable and we can still optimize this entire framework end to end. So that's kind of the, the main part of the method. So um, any questions uh, about it so far? Um, I can ask one. How are these okay. offsets different from flow? It's actually flow, right? Uh, it's it's not exactly flow. Uh, it's um, so our motivation was that yeah, we we expected it sort of to be like flow, but it turns out that they're also kind of some sort of intermediate representation, maybe that that is difficult to um, to interpret actually. So these offsets they're relatively high dimensional, kind of like these uh, CNN filters. So. We think they encode some motion, but it's difficult to understand how exactly. And I think uh, they're actually maybe a little bit more compact. So for example, in this case, we probably don't need to encode flow for every single pixel. We only care about a flow maybe corresponding to the objects. So it's a little bit more compact, I would say. And that's, that's uh, one of the main advantages um, over the flow that usually you have to apply uh, a full network to extract optical flow. And here we only have uh, a few of these deformable convolution layers and it still works. So it's, it's a very sort of compact way to, to do this because it's, it's very difficult to do end-to-end -end training if you actually are using these optical flow CNNs because it's just, you're running out of memory. So that's, that's also kind of one of the motivations that it's just a compact mechanism to represent motion. Thank you. Yeah, and Can so. Thing also? Uh, yeah. Yeah, does it, this question of Fatma, sorry, actually was uh, related to this uh, deformable convolution, maybe is it, does it have something to do with the changing shape of the objects as, as we see in your examples? So maybe they adapt better to, to this, you know, dynamic nature of the shape, maybe? Yes, uh, yes, for sure. So I think it would be fine uh, even like, so, it would be very problematic if you if we used optical flow, uh, but without optimizing this optical flow and uh, optical flow network end to end. Uh, I think this, and we actually have those experiments in the paper. The system kind of breaks down, 
Uh, so one of the key things is that, yeah, everything here is fully differentiable. We can optimize everything with respect to this video and segmentation task. And sure, we do see that the model is able to adapt to these challenging cases of occlusions, uh, deformations in the objects. And with optical flow, if you just use like uh, pre-computed optical flow, this would be pretty difficult to do. Thank you. Okay, so the last step then, once we have these uh, clip level um, segmentation tracks, we need to link them into video level sequences. And so the idea here is that as our info, we might uh, receive maybe a video lasting, let's say more than 30 seconds, maybe even several minutes. And we still wanna be able to produce uh, these video level se segmentations for, for an entire video. Uh, so, and uh, to do this, we use a very simple scheme. Uh, so basically we compare temporally adjacent clips and we measure how well their predicted uh, masks overlap with each other. And if the overlap is high, we then link these clips together. And by repeatedly applying this linking procedure from the first clip to the last clip of the video, we can obtain these final um, video level um, segmentation tracks. So a uh, very simple procedure, but it works quite well. Uh, and it mainly because we already have these very strong clip level and some segmentation predictions. And so now then we look at the results on this YouTube video and some segmentation challenge um, on this YouTube video and some segmentation data set, which is a quite recent data set, uh, which contains about 3000 high resolution videos um, capturing 130,000 uh, object instance masks, uh, which span about 40 object categories. Uh, and so here we compare our mask prop system with respect to two main competitors. So the mask track RCNN, uh, this is the first uh, system that was proposed for this problem. And it's a very simple, unified and elegant system. Uh, but unfortunately, that one of the downsides of this system that it doesn't uh, produce very good numbers on this benchmark. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, we have this ICCV 2019 challenge winner, um, which I already discussed briefly, which uh, basically what they do is they decompose this uh, problem into several subproblems. They solve each of these subproblems independently using ensembles of different models. And even though the system is very complicated and messy, uh, as you can see from the results, it performs very well. And so um, our goal was to kind of get the best of both worlds. So we wanted a simple unified system, but that also has a very strong performance on this task. And from the table, you can see that we managed to accomplish this. So this, despite the simplicity of our model and despite the fact that it's trained on uh, pre-trained on orders of uh, magnitude less labeled data compared to this ICCV 2019 challenge winner, we're still able to outperform it by a pretty substantial margin. Uh, and it just indicates that this is a quite a robust system that works pretty well. And so actually recently, I also um, tried this uh, the same system on the, this year's CVPR 2021 YouTube video and some segmentation challenge. And even though it's been um, more than one year after the publication of our paper, we can still see that we're outperforming most of these methods by a pretty significant margin here. Uh, so I think it just shows that, you know, the system uh, truly works well and it's quite robust. And um, yeah, so I'm happy to see this, these results and we'll see if anybody can outperform this in the next few weeks. Um, and qualitatively, we also see that the results are pretty good. Uh, so our, our method is quite robust to object occlusions. It reliably handles changes in object appearance and pose. And it also successfully tracks small objects, even if they exhibit very large motion. Um, so we have uh, good results, both quantitatively and qualitatively. Um, yeah, so any any questions about, um, that's kind of the last slide on, on this part of the talk, any questions of, about the system? Okay, um, if there are no... It is oh. Actually, I can mention how I found out about mask I because I was impressed by the results, like the difference between mask <laughs> track RCN and then your method. Um, uh -huh. So you said something about classification, right? Like classification yeah. huge. Can you explain that again, please? Uh, the classification uh, in in which in in which part of the system? You you said that it has huge impact in the score. Oh right 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 yeah. So it's uh it's very important to um, 
have a strong backbone um, that basically does, even like at a single frame level, that does detection as well. So I think in this case, both tracking and detection are very important. Um, and I think, um, yeah, so one of the, so I think, and there's, uh, as I mentioned to you, there's sort of two key components why the system works well. So uh, for one, we start with a very good backbone that already performs very well on, um, for example, cocoa detection. Um, and in this case, uh, yeah, it, it also performs well on this YouTube video and some segmentation data set, just like on the individual frames. Uh, and then the second, um, the second component is um, basically this part uh, that I talked about, and the, um, having this uh, basically these very strong clip level tracks. So as you can see now, uh, so we have these clip level tracks, and then it becomes very easy to link them into into sequences, video level sequences. Um, so and I think it also helps um, it, it helps the system a lot to, to achieve a good performance. So I think yeah, it's uh, both detection and this like ability to propagate features to produce these uh, very robust clip level instance tracks. That's those are in my view two key components why the system works so well. Uh, and I think yeah, once you already have this clip level representation, it almost doesn't matter what you do afterwards because like as you can see, sort of this. This linking step, it's super simple. Um, and uh, yeah, like there's no learning here done. So I think, yeah, once you have good uh, detections on the individual frames and th these strong clip level tracks, then, you know, um, then it's, it's easy to obtain good performance. Thank you. Congrats, by the way, for <laughs> the challenge. Well, I mean, it's still like a month left, so we'll see what happens. And I'm not actively working on it, so we'll see. <laughs> Maybe maybe somebody will will come up with a better system. Okay, so let's move to the second part of the talk. And in this case, our focus will be on uh, learning representations that would be useful for understanding how humans interact with objects. Um, and so specifically in this case, also one of the motivations is that we kind of want to move away from this uh, concept of using human supervision and try to find alternative ways of how to supervise our visual models. And to motivate our work, uh, let's take a look at the following video. Breakfast. Never get a chance to eat it Monday to Friday, but Saturday, Sunday, however, is the time when everyone should have a proper breakfast. My perfect breakfast, scrambled egg, sautéed mushrooms and tomatoes. The most important thing about any scrambled egg is stopping it from overcooking. To serve with a scrambled egg, flat cap mushrooms. Just keep them whole and put them in the pan. Lots of olive oil, a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, vine tomatoes. The best way of roasting these is actually keeping them on the vine, in the pan with the mushrooms. Right. Just let those mushrooms and tomatoes sit there in the pan on a low heat and they'll cook themselves. So as you can see, this is an instructional video where this famous chef Gordon Ramsay is teaching us how to make breakfast. And uh, because of the instructional nature of the video, uh, we see that his instructional speech aligns very well with the video content. So for example, he's talking about the mushrooms. And the video also zooms into the mushrooms, or he's talking about frying tomatoes. And in the video, we see him putting tomatoes in a frying pan. And so this alignment between instructional speech and video content is exactly what we want to exploit in this case. Um, and so specifically, the problem that we're going to considering now is that trying to learn a representation that would be useful uh, to better understand how humans interact with objects. And this is an important problem because um, even just knowing which objects people are interacting with already gives us lots of useful cues about that person's behavior. For example, uh, what that person is paying attention to, what kind of actions they're performing, and even maybe what their intentions might be. Um, and so the key challenge when we consider um, this problem is that many objects in these human object interactions exhibit extremely dramatic variations in their appearance. So for example, in the case of tomatoes, we can see that they can be chopped or halved, liquid or solid, fresh or fried, red or green. So many different uh, object states, many different actions that can be applied to these objects. And our goal in this work is to essentially uh, learn a representation. So what we refer to as this contextual uh, representation that captures all these additional cues behind human object interactions. And so this is in contrast to prior work that mainly detects objects at a very coarse level where a label spaces are usually expressed in terms of nouns such as egg, fish, plant, meat. 
And in this case, in addition to, for example, being able to recognize that there's an egg in this image, we would also want to know the, its object state, what kind of action has been applied to it, and maybe even whether our accompanying objects are around. Um, so that's kind of the goal. And so we're not the first to look at this problem. There's been uh, some prior work in this area, but the key limitation of these prior methods is that um, most of them rely on manually labeled data. And this is quite problematic because even if we just consider a single object category, uh, such as tomato, in order to list all of its possible states, all of the actions that can be applied to it, it just uh, the label space just explodes exponentially. And so in order to collect all of these labels, we would need uh, lots of time, resources, and money. So in my view, it's completely unscalable and impractical to do this. And so that's why we basically want to uh, shift our focus from this uh, using manually annotated data and try to find alternative ways of uh, how to solve this problem. And so as already hinted, in this case, our solution is to leverage this recently introduced how to 100 million data set, which is a large scale instructional data set that contains uh, over 100 million clips, uh, which uh, where every clip also comes with an automatic, automatically transcribed speech narration. Um, and so this is, um, this is a very nice data set for our purposes because um, it contains lots of human object interactions. And now we also have these more detailed descriptions of what people are doing in those videos, which come uh, in a form of these uh, automatically transcribed speech narrations where people are literally describing what they're doing in those videos, what kind of tasks they're performing, what kind of actions they're doing. Uh, so that's kind of the main motivation why we want to use this data set. And the only missing thing in this data set is that it doesn't have any bounding box annotations. So in addition to being able to learn these uh, contextual cues behind human object interactions, we would also like to uh, localize which objects people are interacting with. Uh, and so to address the shortcoming, we use a very simple procedure. So we run a, a pre-trained object detector on the frames of how to 100 million, and we then consider the most confident object detections and we check whether those detections also match with the provided speech narration. So for example, if our visual detector says that there's a rolling pin in a given video frame and also the speech narration mentions a rolling pin, we then consider that as a positive instance and we add it to our new data set. And so this simple procedure allows us to collect 1.1 million pseudo ground truth bounding boxes for 154 object categories and about 560,000 frames of how to 100 million. <clears throat> and so now we have this very nice data set where we have uh, <clears throat> bounding boxes of the objects. We have their course object level categories. And we also have uh, these more detailed descriptions of what people are doing with those objects uh, in a form of these uh, speech narrations. And we can then use this data set to train our contextualized object embeddings model, uh, which we refer to as COBE. So our system takes as input a video frame with an automatically transcribed speech narration, and we first forward this uh, speech narration through a pre-trained transformer-based language model, which then outputs a contextualized word embedding for every word in a sentence. And so the key characteristic of these transformer-based language models is that these contextualized word embeddings, they capture information not only related to the word itself, but also from the entire sentence. So for example, the feature vector associated with the word egg also captures information related to the contextual action of breaking and also the contextual object of bowl. And in a sense, that's exactly what we want to do, but in the visual domain. So just like these language models learn contextualized representations for words, so too we want to learn these contextualized representations for objects in the visual domain. And so to do that in parallel, we also feed a given video frame through our visual detection model, which in this case corresponds to a modified fast RCNN. And here the key difference is that instead of having a standard classification branch, which simply predicts course object level categories, now we have this contextualized object embedding branch, which outputs a continuous vector representation for every detected object instance. And to guide this predicted object embedding to be similar to the contextualized word embedding, uh, we use a contrastive loss function. And so this contrastive loss function is expressed using the formula in the slide, uh, where F here is our predicted visual object embedding. 
G plus uh, depicts uh, a vector corresponding to a positive word embedding that actually describes <clears throat> an object in a given video frame. And G minus here depict all these negative vectors that are essentially not related to the object in a given video frame. And so by optimizing our model with respect to this loss function, we're basically forcing it to learn a visual representation that is similar to this positive word embedding and is dissimilar to all these other negative word embeddings. And basically what happens as a byproduct of optimizing with respect to this loss function, the model kind of learns to align visual and textual representations. And in the end, our learned visual representation uh, lies on the same manifold as all of these textual feature descriptors. And because of that, afterwards, we can apply our system for various text-based applications. And the first application that we consider here is the object to text retrieval. So given a visual query in the form of a detected object instance, uh, we want to retrieve most similar text with respect to that object query. And here the text comes in a form of object context tuples. So object here depicts a course object level category and context can be any other word describing some contextual information uh, about that object. And so here we visualize some of these uh, retrievals. So here the green bounding box depicts our visual query and the text below um, essentially illustrates the most similar uh, retrieved text with respect to that object. And as you can see from these results, our model actually learns to capture a diverse set of contextual cues. So for example, in the first column, we see that our, our model is able to detect that there's onion and that there's a pan uh, in this frame. But now it also knows that the onion is chopped, that the pan contains onions, and that the onion is being sauteed. Uh, similarly, in the third column, we see that the model is able to detect that there's a tomato. But now it also knows that the tomato is being sliced, that there's a knife nearby, and that these are cherry tomatoes. Uh, so it's basically able to capture lots of these different uh, contextual information. And um, uh, so now, in a sense, it's, it's exactly what we want, because now, in addition to being able to represent these course object level categories, we also are now able to capture all of these contextual details. And we can also actually reverse this task. And instead of doing object to text retrieval, we can also do text to object retrieval. So here, given a textual query of the same form, a form object to a context tuple, we can retrieve most similar object instances in Kobe space. And here we visualize some of these top retrievals. So every column here depicts a fixed object category and every row uh, essentially represents uh, different contextual cues. And again, we see that the model is able to learn a variety of different contextual cues which capture objects, functional properties, the actions applied to them, uh, colors, uh, shapes, uh, um, things like that. So for example, in column two, we see that for an object category sauce, the model is able to capture different kinds of sauces, such as barbecue sauce, hot sauce, soy sauce. Uh, in the last column, we see that for an object category pepper, it's able to represent different uh, colors of peppers. So all kinds of different things. Um, and uh, so it's nice to see that now we can sort of move uh, away from this, uh, just a course object level category understanding. And we can also have a more detailed understanding what's happening with those objects. So um, any, any questions uh, on this part of the talk? Okay, so let me move to the last part of the talk. And uh, so in, in this part of the talk, I'll talk about our, our latest framework of learning to recognize human actions in video. And so specifically here, uh, we'll be focusing on a supervised video classification task. Um, so given a video, we will want to classify it into one of the human action categories. So just as shown in the slide. And before I start describing our framework, um, I wanted to take a step back and briefly talk about the modern language models, which kind of serve as an inspiration to the model that we're going to be proposing in this part of the talk. So as you're all probably aware, in the last few years, the field of natural language processing has been revolutionized by the self-attention based models, such as the transformer model. And so their simplicity, their ability to learn from large scale data, and most importantly, their ability to capture long-range dependencies in the data is what makes them so attractive. 
And at the moment, these, uh, these self-attention-based models represent state of the art in lots of natural language processing tasks, such as question answering, text generation, machine translation, and so on. Uh, so what is actually the self-attention um, mechanism? Um, so conceptually, it's a very simple idea. Um, basically, consider that as an input, we're given a sentence, as is shown in the slide. So what self-attention allows us to do is it allows us to gather relevant context um, and essentially encode it into the feature vectors associated with individual words. So for example, in this case, if we consider uh, a word such as Bob, uh, self-attention would allow us to incorporate the context from this entire sentence, Bob is a student, into the individual feature vector associated with the word Bob. And why would this be useful? Well, now if somebody asked us a question, what is Bob's occupation? Just by looking at this individual feature vector, we would be able to tell that Bob is a student because it already captures all of his contextual information. And so, of course, in this case, we can apply this uh, for every single word in a sentence. And technically, it's also the self-attention mechanism. It's very simple. Uh, it's nothing really more than a, a weighted feature averaging. And so we can even uh, walk, uh, uh, do a step-by-step -step walk through how this is implemented. So X here uh, essentially depicts a 2D feature matrix um, at layer L, where every row uh, corresponds to a D-dimensional feature vector corresponding to one of the words in a sentence. So assuming N words in a sentence in this case. Then we also have these three learnable projection weights, which allow us to map this initial feature matrix into an intermediate feature space. And in a literature, these are commonly referred to as query key and value matrices. And these are simply obtained by performing matrix multiplication between this initial feature matrix and the learnable projection weights. And lastly, the self-attention operation is implemented as a scale dot product attention, uh, which consists of three operations. So first, uh, we perform a dot product between matrices Q and K. And this allows us to compute pairwise similarities between every single pair of feature vectors, or in this case, every single pair of words. Afterwards, we apply softmax normalization to make sure that every one of these similarities map to the range between zero and one and also to ensure that every row in this case sums up to one. And then lastly, uh, we then uh, perform a matrix multiplication between this normalized uh, feature similarity matrix um, and this uh, matrix V. And this is essentially where this weighted feature averaging is happening. And this is a step that allows us to incorporate context from the entire sentence into the feature vectors associated with individual words. Um, and so even though, as you can see, it's a very simple mechanism by stacking the self-attention on top of each other many times, we can come up with these very powerful transformer models. And now the question is, why do we care about the self-attention or these modern language models? Well, we care about it because at a high level, uh, natural language processing shares several similarities with video understanding. So for one, uh, both sentences and videos are fundamentally sequential. So you would think that whatever model works well for natural language processing, to some degree, it should also generalize to video understanding as well. But even more importantly, um, we know that in a lot of cases to understand the meaning um, behind individual words, a lot of times we need to look into broader context and we need to look at an entire sentence. And similarly, you could argue that in order to understand the meaning of um, on these atomic actions in short video segments, we also need to leverage broader context and we need to look at an entire video. And so that's why we think that these long range self-attention based models would also be highly effective for video understanding. However, if we look at prior work in video classification, we see that most state of the art methods in this case are still built uh, on top of 2D or 3D convolutions for spatiotemporal feature learning. And despite the effectiveness of these models in the last few years, we argue that 3D convolutions are not the best way to do video modeling because they're inherently designed to only capture short range spatiotemporal dynamics. And in contrast, these transformer models, these self-attention-based operators, uh, they're much more flexible in a sense that they can capture both short-range and long-range dynamics. So that's kind of the motivation why we're pursuing this direction. And so the, the key question then becomes, uh, how do we pre-process a video so that we could, um, we could then feed it into these uh, self-attention-based transformer models? 
So inspired by recent work in image classification, uh, we simply decompose the video into a sequence of non-overlapping frame level patches as is shown here. And so we can then augment each of these patches with some spatiotemporal position information, essentially encoding where in the video this patch appears, both spatially and temporally. And we can then feed it uh, into the transformer encoder. And so the nice thing about the scheme is that it basically allows us to um, interpret the, the resulting sequence of feature vectors uh, as tokens that can be fed into the transformer analogously to the tokens obtained from words in the natural language processing. So in a sense, uh, it allows us to kind of recharacterize this video understanding framework into the similar framework as it's used for natural language processing. Uh, but the problem with this is that, as already described a few slides ago, is that in this case, the self-potential operation, it requires computing similarities for every single pair of tokens, or in this case, every single pair of patches. And in the case of video understanding, we usually have videos uh, that consist more than 30 frames. Uh, and so the number of patches becomes uh, extremely large to the point where computing similarity for every single pair of these patches becomes too costly. And so this brings uh, us to the main focus of, uh, of this part of the talk, which is to design a scalable uh, space-time self-attention scheme that would be both efficient and effective. And so in this case, we investigate a few of such self-attention schemes. So uh, namely space-only attention, uh, joint space-time attention, and then lastly, our proposed divided space-time attention. Uh, and so let me first talk about the space-only attention illustrated on the very left. Uh, so what I'm visualizing here, uh, this blue patch essentially depicts a query patch for which in this case, we wanna uh, produce this new self-attention based representation. And so in practice, of course, we want to do this for every single patch, but just for illustrative purposes, I'm only visualizing this specific case, just so that we could understand the differences between uh, each of these self-attention schemes. And so all these other differently colored patches, they basically depict the self-attention uh, neighborhood with respect to this blue query patch. So basically all the patches for which we need to compute these pairwise similarities. And as you can see, because this is a spatial attention, we're only considering in this case patches that appear in the same frame as this blue query patch. And of course, the advantage of the scheme is that, uh, that now um, basically we don't need to compute pairwise similarities for every single pair of patches. But of course, uh, the downside is that um, in this case, we cannot do any temporal modeling. And so it will kind of serve as a baseline how well we can do it only if we consider these uh, spatial dynamics. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have this joint space-time attention, uh, which I already talked a little bit. So this is just a standard self-attention implementation. Uh, where now essentially we're considering every single pair of patches. Um, and so of course the advantage is that now we can do full spatiotemporal modeling, but the disadvantage is that now um, this, this baseline is very computationally expensive because we have to consider every single pair uh, of these patches. And so to address this uh, computational shortcoming, uh, we propose uh, a divided space-time attention scheme. And here the key idea is to essentially factorize this um, joint space-time attention into its two components, into the spatial and temporal attention. And as you can see, the spatial attention, it's implemented in the same way as before. So we're only considering patches that appear in the same frame um, as this blue query patch. But now we also have this temporal attention depicted by green patches. And so now we're considering all these other patches from uh, different frames in the video, but only patches that appear at the same spatial position uh, as this blue query patch. And as you can see, the advantage of this is now we can do both spatial and temporal modeling, but at the same time, we don't need to compute pairwise similarities for every single pair of patches which makes this uh, scheme much more effective compared to this joint space-time attention. And if we look at the results, um, here we, we evaluate each of these self-attention schemes on uh, two popular action recognition benchmarks, uh, Kinetics 400 and something something V2. Um, and so we see that in this case, this uh, divided space-time attention scheme that we're proposing, um, it achieves uh, a better performance than each of these other self-attention schemes. 
And interesting uh, to note is that the space only attention, it actually performs quite well on kinetics, which is known to, to be sort of spatially biased in a sense that um, there's lots of scene recognition going on on this data set. And so maybe temporal modeling is not that effective. But then if we look on the results uh, on something something data set, we see that the space only attention performs terribly on it. And um, our model, this divided space-time attention scheme, it outperforms the space-only scheme by more than 20%, which indicates that temporal modeling is indeed quite important on this uh, second data set. And in terms of computational cost, we also do comparisons between our divided space-time attention scheme and this joint space-time attention scheme. And here, basically, what I'm visualizing is um, the computational cost measured in TFLOPs as we increase the spatial resolution of the video, which is a plot on the left, or if we increase the video length, or basically the number of input frames, which is a plot on the right. And so as you can see here, um, our scheme, our divided space-time attention scheme, um, it scales reasonably well in both of these scenarios, but this joint space-time attention scheme, um, basically the computational cost just kind of grows uh, pretty rapidly to the point where we can't even use those models anymore because they simply run out of GPU memory. And so both of these kind of experiments, they validate our design in a sense because now we have this model that's both more effective and also more efficient. And so that's what we use for the rest of our experiments. Uh, and so here next, we compare this model, which we call Transformer from Time and Space Transformer with respect to state of VR, which mainly consists of these uh, 3D convolutional based models. And here we show that again, this transformer model um, it outperforms all of these prior approaches. And again, this kind of validates this initial hypothesis that we had that maybe these 3D convolutions are not the best way to do video modeling, but maybe instead, you know, these self-attention based operations could be more effective uh, uh, at doing this. And here indeed, we showed that this is the case. And another set of experiments that I wanted to talk about, which I'm particularly excited about is, uh, so one of, the, one of the nice properties of this transformer model is that it basically, um, it allows us to scale the video inputs to, to much longer video clips. So most of these 3D CNNs, they're designed to operate on um, videos that contain maybe from eight to 32 frames. And in this case, the scalability of our model allows it to extend it to uh, videos that contain um, 96 frames, which is a significant departure from all of his prior work. And so this, um, this ability to do that, um, we want to test it. And so specifically, we want to see how useful it is for long-term video modeling. And so here, what we do is we create a new benchmark uh, using this um, how to 100 million data set, which I already discussed. And so the nice thing about this how to 100 million data set is that basically has lots of these uh, longer videos where people are um, performing all kinds of tasks, for example, making breakfast, cleaning house, uh, repairing a car. So all kinds of tasks that essentially require more longer term understanding. And so this is uh, in big contrast to, for example, this kinetics benchmark, which basically only require understanding videos from five to 10 seconds. And so here, most of these videos last about seven minutes um, in length. Uh, and all of these uh, categories that we have, these action categories, they, um, you can't predict them just by looking at several seconds of the video. You actually have to look at much longer video extents. Uh, so we think that this is a great benchmark to test this ability to do long-term video modeling. And so that's basically what we want to do. And so we train um, our model. Uh, on this benchmark, as well as this uh, slow pass baseline that we have. And so here, the, um, uh, so let me just briefly uh, explain what this table means. So the single clip coverage um, here in the third column of the table, it essentially denotes the number of seconds spanned by a single clip. And so this is, uh, this is basically controlled by two variables, the number of input frames and the frame sampling rate. Um, so for example, in the first case, uh, so in this case, all of these baselines, they basically use the frame sampling rate of one over 32, meaning that uh, we sample every 30, um, every 30 second uh, frame. Uh, and so it allows us to kind of span longer video extents. 
And by increasing the number of input frames, we can then basically uh, represent uh, more of a video. And this, the number of test clips, uh, it essentially depicts the average number of clips needed to cover the entire input video during inference. And so as already discussed, most of these videos last about seven minutes. Um, and so here, uh, in order to fairly compare all of these methods, uh, we basically sample as many test clips that, uh, as are needed to cover an entire video. So as you can see for this first baseline, uh, that spans um, 8.5 seconds with a single clip we would need to sample about 48 clips. And for this, uh, these last baselines that span about 100 seconds with a single clip, we would only need to, to sample about four clips. And so here, there's uh, a few interesting things uh, that are happening. So first we see that for the same single clip coverage, our transformer model outperforms the corresponding slope as baseline. And as you can see, it does so by a pretty large margin. And so here, what this essentially indicates is that this uh, slow pass baseline, it's not very well suited to operate in settings where maybe the, you know, the frame sampling grade is, um, is so, so low, like basically if we're sampling frames um, with the, uh, where the gap between adjacent frames is very large. And so essentially it's not very well suited for long-term video modeling, where, whereas Timesformer is able to, to handle this pretty well. And also another thing that we observe is that these longer range transformers, uh, they do better at this task. And this essentially indicates that this is the task that, that requires longer term video understanding. And also that our model is able to kind of exploit the, the long range dependencies in the data um, to basically achieve better numbers on, on this benchmark. And so I'm, I'm pretty excited about these results because I think this is a task that's been overlooked for a long time and mainly because uh, a lot of these 3D CNNs is just like, it's very difficult to apply them in these scenarios where you're considering long videos. And so I'm hoping that with this new model that we're introducing, uh, a lot more people will be able to investigate these uh, longer range understanding problems. Um, we also here show some of the qualitative results. So just basically visualizing this learned space-time attention. So which regions in the video our model uh, learns to pay attention to. And here we, we do see that sort of our model, even though it's not optimized explicitly to localize these regions, um, in a sense, it learns to pay attention to relevant um, objects in the video, like hands or you know, the objects that people are interacting with. Uh, and it makes sense because it has to use all of this information for complex spatial temporal reasoning. Um, yeah, and so to summarize, uh, so I started this presentation by, um, by having this outline where we looked at three different problems. Uh, so first uh, we looked um, at, this, at this problem of trying to uh, detect and track objects in video. And we showed uh, um, that we introduced this mass crop system uh, which was able to outperform all prior methods uh, on, the, on, the, on the video and sense segmentation benchmarks. And we see that now even uh, a year um, after the submission, we're still able to do very well um, on this problem. Afterwards, we, look, uh, we looked at this slightly different problem of trying to learn a representation that would be useful for understanding how humans interact with objects. And we introduced this large scale learning framework, COBE. And we showed that instead of relying on manually annotated data, instead we can leverage these automatically transcribed speech narrations for learning these contextualized object representations. And lastly, I presented this, our newest work on Timesformer, which provides a fundamentally different way to do video modeling. And we showed that not only does it outperform 3D convolutional models, but it's also suitable for these uh, new interesting problems such as uh, long range video understanding. Uh, and with that, um, I, I also wanted to acknowledge my collaborators uh, who contributed to uh, some part of this work. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions now. Thank you, Gildas. I think there is a question. Um, so, uh, can I ask? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. So uh, I, I wasn't sure about the format of these data sets. You mentioned language being part of some of these data sets. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, are, are these transformers only applied to the video or jointly applied to language and video? 
I mean, so in this case, um, yeah, so like uh, I, I would say it's applied separately and it depends on the problem. So for example, in the second part where we were considering these instructional data sets, um, we actually, we use transformer for language only. And the idea was to kind of use it as means to supervise our visual model, which at that point it was still a convolutional model. But then uh, following that work, uh, we also wanted to kind of design a video model that is based on these transformer uh, models. And so the, the last part of the talk was kind of, uh, so there was no language involved, just you know trying to apply these self-attention based techniques on uh, video data. Right, so I mean, the reason I'm asking is that the original um, transformer model with the encoder decoder machine translation uh, task mm -hmm. It has cross attention as well as self attention, mm -hmm. and uh, it seems to me like in 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 tasks that involve language and video, let's say, uh, some that that kind of cross attention might actually um, you know give you uh, an advantage possibly if we were able to train it. For sure, for sure, and so I think um, I mean that's honestly that's one of the motivations of trying to design these um, transformer based models for video understanding because now maybe. I don't know, let's say, you know, we look at the problem of uh, video question answering where now we have to simultaneously process both video and language. Um, I think the current pipelines are not very good for that because we separately process video, we separately process language, and then we try to do this high level reasoning, which, I mean, you would think that you would wanna already, before processing the video, you will already wanna incorporate question information. And I think these kind of, joint transformer models would allow that. So I think, yeah, that's that's a great observation. It's, yeah, it, like we'll be looking at, into that. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. That was one of the future work mentioned in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> About the paper, Gedas, I have a question, if there yeah. are no other questions. So you apply this time attention first, and then mm -hmm. you compute the key query values again, and you do the space attention, right? Yeah, yeah. So I would, assume the number of like the, maybe if you had enough computational resources or i don't know like you would have mm -hmm. time one again and then space one again like repeating this procedure right that would you ex expect any improvements from applying attention again and again one after another so we actually, I mean, yeah, so that's, um, I didn't go into full architecture due to um, uh, time constraints, but yeah, that's kind of what we do. So we do this like uh, 12 times, uh, basically this, uh, the block that we have um, here. Um, yeah, so it's essentially repeated um, like a bunch of times. Um, it's kind of stacked on top of each other and it allows the model to sort of, um, yeah, just basically aggregate both spatial and temporal information. And I think, uh, yeah, if we applied it only one or two times, I don't think this would work effectively, uh, but yeah. From the figure in the paper, I thought it's just applied once, but thank you for clarifying. No, yeah, it's, uh, I guess the figure in the paper, yeah, that's kind of, I guess the, the main block, which we then kind of, we just repeated like 12 times and then that's kind of the, the full architecture. I see, I see, I see, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Gedas, for this great talk. And thank you for answering our questions. And thanks everyone for attending. I guess we see you next week. Okay, yeah, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure.